Oh, team, thank you so much. Oh, I love worshiping with you. Oh, hello. My name is Jason. I'm one of the pastors here at the church, and I do. I do love worshiping with you. Oh, it's so great. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful morning. Um, I was sharing with our team um, before we came out, you know, there, there's those days and those weeks where it feels like um, there, there's just highs of highs and lows and lows. Have you ever had one of those weeks where it's just amazing news after amazing news, and then it's bad news after bad news, and there's just like this roller coaster. And, um, and I know that in this room, there's, there's definitely all of that is covered. Um, so I want to I start on a, a high end and then end on a low n- end, and then we're going to pray over all of it. But um, I just want to share with you something I'm very excited about. Um, we have been just always, I mean, since I've been here at the church, we've just been in transition. We've just been moving. We're trying to get all the puzzle pieces together and what's God going to do with us and for us. And, and as we're going about doing all that, um, different things uh, change a- as time goes on. And, and um, I wanted to let you know I'm very excited that th- this next Sunday, not this Sunday, but next Sunday is going to be a Sunday where we are turning our worship arts leadership over from Pastor John over to um, Allison Kovich. And if you haven't seen it, Allison was out here singing, and uh, she is going to come and help us focus in on that. I know when uh, John actually came on, I got word that our worship person was going to leave within like, like, I think it was four weeks or something like that. And then John came in and filled in for us. And um, I remember, just so, so thankful, and I know John's like, hey, you know, this is like my thing, right? Like, it kills me sometimes, no, no, almost literally kills him to come up and play. Like, last Sunday, um, John didn't, of course, you couldn't tell this because this he's a man. Um, he was running like 102 temperature and leading us in worship. Yeah, and then, you know, he's had some unique, like, health issues, but he's just been so faithful. And so he's going to be helping us out with, well, he helps us a lot with all kinds of things around the church. So he's going to be helping us out with a lot of different things here at the church. But we're going to pass it over to Allison to, to run this thing. Here's what we want to do. Um, we mentioned this before. If you are a person, and if you're online and you're watching as well, you are a person who has gifts in the worship arts. You can sing, or you think you can sing. We'll let you know. We'll let you know. Um, <laughs> If you can play, um, again, we would love to hear from you. And as time goes on, Allison's going to set up some tryouts um, to have you audition a little bit so we can start building some teams to let some of us have some giftedness utilized up here for the God and for his kingdom. Um, I know for for a fact there's one uh, family that's here in our church. They have been here, I don't know, about six months. He's a classically trained pianist. And I'm like, and why don't we have you up here yet? And so we're going to put those systems into place to do that. And so I'm excited. So it kind of worked out. Uh, Pastor John and I were talking about like timelines and all that. And of course, as many of you know, um, a few weeks back we had Allison and her husband uh, Ryan up here on stage. And they just gave birth to their first child. So we didn't know what her time frame was going to be in regards to the baby. But she had the baby early. And so we were able to start the progress on uh, moving forward with that. So excited about that and then um, also too as I told you you know weeks are like that right there's like these highs and then there's these lows Um, the amount of text messages I got this week and voicemails of people going through hard time it it, it, it's been overwhelming to be honest Um, people and then again there's some of you might be watching online excuse me I got this tickle in my throat it's been all morning I don't know if else has this but this week was hard. Numerous family members in the hospital. And us not knowing what, what the Lord's going to do. And if God's going to sustain them and, and allow them to stay here on this, this place. And even as before I got up, uh, Tammy shared with me one of our family members here in our church. Just got word that mom is not doing so hot. And we don't know. And so in church, isn't that how it is? We, we come to worship together. And you don't know what's in the room. You don't know if it's been one of those great weeks where someone got the promotion that they've been dreaming out and praying about. And then also to the heavy heartedness. And, and that's what it's like to be a part of a church. And so I want to let you know for those that are heavy hearted, I love you. Um, I know what you're going through. And uh, we're praying for you. And for those of you that are rejoicing, by the way, don't hold back your rejoice. We're going to rejoice with you. But we're also, as the Bible said, I, I had one um, brother sharing, sharing some stuff with me and And they're like, I'm sorry to be pouring this on you. And the scripture is very clear, right? We're to to carry each other's burdens. That's what we're to do for each other. 
So when we're winning, we're, we're applauding all of us winning, and we're, we're losing, we're putting our arms around each other, and we're carrying each other. And so, again, so I, I just want the church to know that that's what is represented here today and even online. So for those of you that are online and can't join us because of health issues and all the other things, I'm so thankful this church had the foresight years ago to start this so we can communicate with you. And, and can I say for all of you that invested in this church time and time again with your faithful giving, it's because of you that we have that ability to still reach out to our loved ones who are possibly just bedridden. And um, it's a blessing to them, so thank you for that. So again, as you can see, God's just always, he's always doing. So we're just going to trust in him and keep leaning into him. But um, last week I gave an early, early announcement. Early, early. It's still early, early. But uh, another change is coming our way. We are going to be changing our service times here at Church on the Hill. Um, we start at 10 a.m. I know some of you are like, you do? Yeah, that's why we always see you coming in late. It's okay, it's okay. We're going to move it to 10.30, so just in your mind, and your calendar, go ahead and put 10. You're going to be good. So 10 is going to be good for you, but we're going to start church at 10.30. I thought that was funny, um, but because uh, people are like, that's not funny, because it's you. Um, but we're going to move it to 10.30, and here's the why. A couple different reasons why. Uh, we want to have a time, an hour, to get back to having like a small group Sunday school hour time for our different people. Uh, there's a lot of people in our church, and I've been talking to many of you about, we just need community. We need to start connecting um, in a special way. And I know do, throughout the week, uh, everyone's doing a couple, uh, quite a few things. But to have a, a time, if you're already driving out to church, to have a time where you get together with other believers and get into the Word. And so we're looking at all kinds of different groups that we're going to start. And I'm going to be calling some of you to say, hey, if I haven't already called you, some of you know who you are. That, hey, we need teachers. We want to put teachers on rotation we don't want to just say, hey, you're going to be leading this class and then forget about you. We want to put people on rotation. And so, again, we're be, going to be looking to have an, an hour of getting into small group time together. And then we'll have a half an hour break. And then we'll come in here and worship together. And as God starts to lead us and grow us, um, we will be prepared to launch a first service. And then this would be the second service. Um, of course, God willing, we'll be ready for that. So as you can see, I'm just super excited inside and out. But also, I have a little bit of that burden inside my heart too. Uh, for, for those of you that are going through a hard time. So with all that being said, let's go before the Lord one more time. And let's pray as we get into the message. God, I, I just want to ask, could you take this little tickle that's in my throat out? Um, God, I don't want to keep like sucking on water the whole time I'm preaching. And God, I know that's a, 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 just a personal little thing I need to ask you. And maybe the family here could be praying over that for me as well. But God, I just pray right now, Lord, again. And we never know what life's going to throw at us. God, we can dream great dreams about just everything just being such an... Uh, a blessing and encouraging. And God, there are weeks and months and even years where it feels like, man, we could do no wrong. And God, as some of us are, are, are going through that hard time right now, a heavy heartedness. God, those of us that have been following you long enough know that there are those seasons where it's like, gosh, again, another thing. I mean, I think about family that are in this room right now, Lord, that their, their loved ones are, are struggling with cancer. Some are, 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 are struggling with other diagnosis. Others are struggling about all kinds of other concerns and worries. So God, I know, I know you. We know you as your people. You meet us right where we are at. Lord, I love that about you. You don't say, okay, come on, cheer up so then you can come worship me. No. You say, just come. God, there's something about just showing up and, and, and worshiping you, and maybe not even with our lips, and sometimes our hearts are so heavy, it's hard to even give our hearts over to you. But Lord, that we're just faithful to just coming before you and recognizing and acknowledging that you're God. So Lord, we lift up the remainder of the service. We ask that your holy word would speak, and that you'd move in the hearts and minds of everyone who's here, and you would speak to them to, for like exactly what they need this morning. We praise you, Lord. <clears throat> it's in your name we pray this, Jesus. Amen. Well, as we had mentioned, we're in a brand new series. Well, it's not brand new anymore. It's been a couple weeks now. 
called By Faith. And today I want to talk to you about Build By Faith. So what we're doing is this. We're going through the, 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 the book of Hebrews in the 11th chapter, and that's called the, the, the By Faith chapter. And so we're going along, and we're, going, we're hitting all the different heroes of the faith that are, are in uh, this particular part of, the, of, of Hebrews. And so today, I want to talk about Build by Faith, and we're going to be talking about our brother Noah. Noah. Now, if you don't know much about the Old Testament, maybe you're newer to faith or you're what we call a truth seeker. You're someone who's uh, going to church or maybe watching online. You don't have all the answers yet. This is an Old Testament story talking about a guy who God spoke to and talked about how, hey, man, some really bad stuff's going to come to this planet and I need you to prepare. And, and again, I don't know if you've ever had to build something, but no, as you'll see in the scripture we're going to go over, like, he built something that had never been built before. And I don't know if there are any of you who are, who are mechanically challenged, um, but uh, as a man, it's hard for me to admit this, but I'm mechanically challenged. Um, I have a hard time putting stuff together. A few years back, I decided um, at our last house in San Bernardino, I had this that nice little office, and I told Tammy, I said, hey, babe, I want a, a really nice desk inside my office. And she's like, okay, we'll get the one you want. So I started looking all over the internet. I found this one, and I, saw, I was like, perfect. I did all the measurements. It's going to be great. And I did the measurements, but um, I ended up buying more than I needed. Has anyone ever done that? And so I was like, oh. So I, I ordered this big old desk thing, and it says some assembly required. I, they, they didn't lie. I mean, I don't even know if the, it's... That's worse than a lie. Whoever wrote that on these instructions should have a special place in another place other than heaven, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> I get out, I mean, it, it just pallets of, of stuff. And I'm like, okay, I like, so I just told one of my friends, I go, how do you eat an elephant? One bite what? One bite at a time, yeah. And so I'm like, okay, so I get the instructions and I'm looking at it. And uh, my buddy Kevin's laughing because he probably remembers me whining to him about this. And by the way, you didn't come over and offer to help. <laughs> Just going to rat you out in front of the whole church. I remember opening up, who brought this? Someone brought up stuff while I was praying and I thought it was Jesus. And then I realized it's not because someone else is. Thank you very much. Um, I laid out all the instructions. And as I'm reading through... It has all of the little pieces and things that need to go onto this desk. The count of pieces onto this desk was 827. <laughs> now, Andy, I know you and me, and then we'd be start counting. That, that's a lot of pieces. And I'm thinking, oh no, I am in over my head. So, Phil, what do we do? We just go, okay, well, let me, let me lay out. I can't lay them all out, right? So we're just going to take, we're just to just take just one little cabinet. So I started on the one cabinet, and I got it together, and then I go in the house, and Tam's like, uh, how's it going? I'm like, it's not going. I'm going to have to come home every night after work and work on this thing I, for how long, I don't know. And I don't know how long it took me, but every night I'd come home and just try to get one piece done. And so I got the piece, one piece done, and then I'd move it into my home office, and I'd set it up, and then another piece you know, the next day or next week, and I'd get it all together. And I got done, and well, I was so proud of myself. I was so proud. I'm like, everything's not wobbling. Everything's coming together. It's all starting to work out, right? And as I get to the tail end of this, Don, you won't believe this. I looked, and God was just so good to me. I had a bunch of extra parts. The manufacturer was so sweet just to give me like five of after, like everything. And I'm going, oh no. And so I was thinking, do I go back over in the instructions and do I detail out what I missed? And I go, nah, nah. No, I didn't. But you're going to see as we're talking about build by faith, God might be asking you to build something. He might put something on your heart and speak to you individually about building something. Maybe it's in your marriage. Maybe it's in your kids' lives. Maybe it's into your neighbors that are to your left, your right, where you live. Maybe there's something that God's asking you to uniquely build, and you don't see how it's going to be built. But all we have to do 
is by faith. Trust him. So that's what we're diving in today. We're going to talk about good old Noah. So if you have our bulletins or if you have your Bible app or regular Bible, you can open up to Hebrews 11. Verse 7 is our core verse of the day. And we're going to jump in and, and, and hold on to that. We'll be in and out of Hebrews 11, 7. Um, but then we'll also be going back to the Old Testament and looking at a little bit of Noah's day and what went on there. It says this in Hebrews eleven seven. By faith, Noah... When warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that is in keeping with faith. Well, I want to just go like word by word and just kind of unpack some of this with you. So let's show you the next slide. Hebrews 11, let's talk about this by faith. So it says... By faith, points out, when warned about things not yet seen. Noah's going about his business. He's living life, and we'll see that he's a God-fearing man. He's honoring God with his life. But then God decides to come to him with some information that's going to be big-time news. We're talking world news. And so... He's going to bring him something that no one had ever seen before. Something's going to happen that no one had ever expected to come. And so what was happening here is he's going to talk to him about building something that no one had any recollection or understanding of. Now I know that uh, here, for those of us, and by the way, I know there's many of you that tune in from all over the, the country and even outside of our country you tune in to watch. But here in Southern California, we've been told for years, for years and years and years, that uh, you better be prepared... Because the big one is coming. And if you're not from California or Southern California, you're like, the big, what, what is that? What's the big one? It's called an earthquake, right? Are you right? You remember hearing about this all the time? The, the big one's coming. The big one is coming. And so we've been talking about it for years, and we've had some little shakers here and there, but we've never had the big one yet. And so we kind of are prepared. Some of us are prepared. I've been in some of your homes, and I've seen that some of you actually are prepared. So when this thing hits, I'm coming to your house. But some of us are not. But what was interesting is a few weeks back, you know, we had this hurricane that was coming to California. And then it turned into a tropical storm. And they said, stay inside. And what I noticed that people, and I live in a pretty bougie little area here in Riverside, and I noticed these people took it seriously. They, they, some of these people live on like a hill with no like mudslide challenges at all on them. And they had gone down and filled up, I don't know, 20 or 30 sandbags. They were prepared. And I remember walking along going and looking at PJ. I looked at him like, man, should I be worried? You know, if these people are preparing. And you go to the store and people are actually buying stuff and they're preparing for it. Now, why is it that we've been told forever as Californians, the big one's coming, why is it that we were kind of prepared or not prepared at all? But when we saw that a storm was coming, prepared, because we could see it. They show us, we have radars now showing it, it's on its way, and you need to prepare. So by faith, here's Noah, he was warned about things not yet seen. If you remember, as we're diving into Hebrews, um, Hebrews 11, 1 sets up the whole thing. And this is the context of the whole Hebrews 11. All these heroes of faith that we have looked up to. And by the way, some of you should be in here as well. I, some of the stories you've been through and how God sustained you and helped you and get through hard times. You should be in this list. But Hebrews 11, 1 says, and you'll remember this. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what? What we don't see. You know, that's why a lot of people have a hang-up about following God. It's like, well, I can't see or touch him. I can't see or touch him, so I have a hard time with that. And I know people struggle with some of those things, but here's going to be Noah who's being told by God of something that was to come. So let's go back to Hebrews 11.7, and let's look at this again. So by faith, Noah... When warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear, he built an ark to save who? His family. Now, could you imagine this? I'm just thinking through the scripture. 
as I'm thinking about this, I, I put myself in his shoes. Can you imagine, like, it doesn't say where he got this word. So was he at work? What, what was he doing? And, and God laid this on him that this is what's going to happen. Here's what you're going to build. Can you imagine him, like, coming home from work one day? Tom, can you imagine coming home from work and, hi, honey, how was your day? Well, it was great, but um, God gave me a word. I'm to build something. And can you imagine him sharing this to his beautiful bride? And she's like, oh, what is it? Well, we're supposed to build an, an ark. And we're going to dig into what th that exactly is. But he gets so concerned about this that he knows he's heard from the Lord. And by faith, he doesn't understand it or see it all laid out before him. But he's going to do what God has told him to do. And I think his family is a, a great initiator of that. Can I just say for some of you, you need to have a bigger dream for your marriage. Oh, for, so, so me and my wife or me and my husband can just have a better relationship? No, for some of you, no, for your kids, for your family. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. And so he's got a concern for his family, not just his wife, but his children as well. So let's go over to Genesis and let's start to see what actually is happening through all of this. And again, if you're newer to the faith or haven't read this story, it's an incredible story. So let's look at Genesis 6, 9. It says this. This is the account of Noah and his family. Can, can you remember? It's connecting to this. It says Noah was a righteous man. Righteous means he, right living. He, he honored God with his life. He was blameless among the people of his time. Now watch this, and it says, and he walked faithfully with God. If you tuned in or were here last week, we talked about Enoch. Do you remember Enoch? Talked about he, he walked with God, and we discussed and we unpacked that walk means to have a relationship with Jesus. A walk is connected in a relationship to God. And so what's interesting is Enoch is Noah's great-grandfather. So his father and his grandfather, it doesn't mention anything about them walking with God. But Noah takes up the mantle of righteousness and following God in his family, like, again, his grandfather Enoch. So let's look at Genesis 6, 11 through 12. Genesis 6, 11 through 12 says, Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight. It still is, by the way. And was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on earth had cor corrupted their ways. Let's look at verse 13. It says, so, okay, so God has a plan. By the way, he still has a plan. So God said to Noah, here's what he told him. He says, I'm going to put an end to all people, for the earth is filled with violence because of who? Go ahead, church. It's okay to talk in church. It's okay as long as you're not talking when it's not your cue, right? It was filled with violence because of who? Them. Them. Their wicked hearts. And it says, I am surely going to destroy both them and the earth. And by the way, if you know anything about floods, floods are destructive. So let me, let me fast forward over to Genesis 6, 17 real quick so you can dive in on this. So you can just get some context. He, he, he says this. God says, I'm going to bring floodwaters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens. Every creature that has the breath of life in it, everything on earth will perish. Do you know, this is very fascinating to me, that... All over the world, there are stories about a worldwide flood. Um, actually, there's 200 different flood stories that are found in different cultures all over this globe. It's really remarkable. And, and even uh, the 200 that I'm talking about, there's more than that. There's way more than that. But 200 of these stories actually are very close to the biblical account of this. So let me just read some of the things that line up with these, all 200 of these uh, cultures in a worldwide flood story. 
The first one was this. There's a warning from a God, we understand that, a God, that some of the other cultures wasn't just a God, but it was maybe a gods or us, multiple gods, that there was a flood coming. Um, all these same 200 stories had a hero who built a boat to save himself and his family and a few animals. 200 of these accounts also said that the flood waters would cover the entire earth. These 200 uh, different stories from all these different cultures talked about the boat coming to rest on a mountaintop. And these 200 different accounts all over the world also from these different cultures had flood, flood waters receding and the hero and his family repopulating the earth. How is it that that story is all over this planet? How is it that it, it just it, it proliferated out? Is, how did that happen? Well, if you know your Bible... Um, and studied it all in Genesis chapter 11. It talks about the human race really coming together and, and uniting after the flood. And uh, they got so united that, uh, man, they, they were thinking a lot of themselves. Everyone was speaking the same language. And they ended up building this thing called the Tower of what? Babel. Babel. And so God saw that and how they were unifying, how they are getting prideful. So God ended up sending down to them this, um, this way of breaking up and disturbing their communication. And so people groups lost the way how to speak their language. So imagine, I've known you for years, and we've always spoke English, and all of a sudden, I start speaking Mandarin Chinese. Uh, I, I met a, a good, a, a new friend here, I don't know if it was Beth, it was it last week or the week before? Um, was it last week? I can't remember, last week. And uh, she, she's studying um, to, to, to be a missionary, and uh, she's from China, and she spoke really good English. Um, but uh, again, uh, but her primary language is Chinese. And so what happened is, is back in that time that, that God had already, they already had this story, but now that their, their languages got messed up, then they scatter all over the world to be with their people groups. So this story had been passed on and passed on and passed on. And as you know, as stories get passed on from generation to generation, little details change here and there. But there's an account of a world flood everywhere. I can, be, I can remember years ago being a youth leader up at summer camp at uh, Thousand Pines Christian Camp. And, and, <clears throat> and while I was up there, we had a speaker that week. And the speaker that week was a, was a missionary, and he was a, a Wycliffe Bible translator. Have you ever heard of them, Wycliffe? And so he was up there speaking for the week, and we were talking. He was a wild man. He had his bushy hair. and He never wore shoes. Like, he just went around the whole camp not wearing shoes like the whole week. And um, he definitely looked like John the Baptist. That was kind of like his, his thing. And as I was talking to him, he was sharing that when he went into this new tribe, he was working with Papua New Guinea type tribes. He went into this new tribe that people hadn't, like, really had association with. And so he's trying to talk with the chief about all the different uh, stories that maybe this guy knows about. So this guy would share a story, and then um, our Bible translator would tell stories from the Bible. And when they got to Noah and the flood, the chief goes, oh, we have a similar story. He goes, our story is that, that God did flood the earth, but then a huge turtle showed up. And then uh, there was this hero who got on to and his family, and this, this turtle saved them. This turtle saved them. So all over the world there is stories of the flood account. So let's go back to our, our scripture, Genesis 6, 14. So God now starts to put something together here, and this is so much fun as I was studying. I hope you enjoy it as well. But in Genesis 6, 14, God tells him, okay, here's what you're going to do. I'm going I'm to flood the whole place, so here's what I want you to do. So make for yourself an ark of cypress wood, make rooms in it, and coat it with pitch inside and out. I want to point out to you this word ark. So if you're a Bible nerd and you want to circle that in your Bible or the notes we gave you, take a little note of this. I looked into this word ark in the Hebrew. Like what, what, what's the word there and what does it mean? And it's this word teva, teva. Say it with me, church. Teva, teva. The V is actually a B. I'm horrible at pronouncing like the original Hebrew. Just trust me on this. But it's teva. And this word teva means this. It means Three different things it can mean. One is this, a basket. It can mean a basket. So you can imagine Noah sitting there and hearing, teva, like you gotta, this is what you've got to make. And, 
and he's like, okay, a basket. And then this same word here, it's very interesting, is the same word you can use for the basket that Moses was put in when he was a baby and sent down the stream. And if you don't know that story, don't have time to unpack that for you. But for those of you who've been in church a while, understand that, that, that this baby was put in a basket and sent downstream because the, she was worried that the Egyptians were going to kill her son. And so that teba, that's, that's the, 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 the description of that. Um, here's another one. This is kind of scary. The next thing that can help describe teba is a casket. Church, I thought I'd get more eruption over that. When I saw that, and God's saying, I'm going to destroy all people. I want you to build a casket. Well, okay, so it can mean basket. It can mean casket. Boy, just one letter just changes the whole, like, the scenario. But it can also mean, like, a ship or, or a boat. So, so how... Is it that Moses is going to know, I'm sorry, Noah, going to know the difference? It goes on in Genesis 6, 15 through, uh, 15 through 16. It says this. This is how you're going to build it, the Teba, the ark. It's going to be 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high. Then he says, make a roof for it. Leave below the roof an opening, one cubit high, all around. Now watch this. He says, put a door. Okay, you're not putting a door inside of a basket. And well, you might put a door inside of a casket. But he says, put a door in the side of the ark and make lower, middle, and upper decks. So he gave him a subscription, uh, a prescription, I should say, a measurements of how big this is supposed to be. So how he knows that it is a boat and not a casket or a basket is that this understanding, if we change the cubits to feet, the vessel would be 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high. Um, there was this one, Dr. Morris, who actually did some of the calculations. Some people have refuted this a little bit and gave it more and gave it less. But he said, after calculating the size of the ark, that it could contain enough livestock of 500 livestock railroad cars. So, I mean, this is, this is quite a big, big thing. And by the way, some people um, have raised money and actually built a life-size ark. Is it in Pennsylvania? Kentucky, I should have known that. It's Kentucky, Kentucky. I haven't seen it yet, but there's pictures if you want to go on and see what it looks like. It's, it's ginormous, ginormous. So he understands that it's, not, it's a boat. It's a boat. So he, he gets all this information, and we go back to Hebrews eleven seven, 7, our core text for today. And, and again, I hope you're enjoying this. We're, we're pulling a little bit out of this, and then we're going back and seeing where it kind of comes into play. So Hebrews eleven seven. 7. So now, by faith... No, when he warned about things not yet seen, it says this, in holy fear. In holy fear. Uh, we should never ever fear God in the sense of um, uh, him hating us and what have you. I, this is what I call a, a holy fear is a, um, oh, how do I say this? This is a, a healthy fear that someone should have uh, for a, an honest and God-fearing um, dad. Now, my dad wasn't always a God-fearing man, but my dad did speak the truth to us. And uh, I can remember as a boy, uh, we went to Disneyland. We only went once when I was a kid. We couldn't afford to go to Disneyland. This is back in the day when they had the e-tickets. You know, those little tickets you had to rip out to go on the ride. Yeah, you guys now just walk in, do the rides. I hate you. Um, but we had to have these tickets, and we'd barter with each other which ticket. And so we went once as a, as a child. And I remember it was such a great day, and we went to Disneyland. It was so much fun, and we got in the parking lot, and we're still just like filled up with candy like kids do, right? And we're running around, and it didn't matter what we were doing, how we were running. And Phil, I don't know how you did all your brood of kids and how you got them to be in check, but I know that when you raise your voice, I'm sure they went. Whew. But my dad, if we were just doing whatever, if I heard my dad say, boys, it didn't matter what you were doing, you stopped. Like red light, green light, do you remember that playing as a kid? It's just like, Arr. like, and did not move. And so there's this healthy fear, right, 
of my dad. And, and so there's this holy fear that Noah has towards God. And we have to have a heart towards God and understanding that when he speaks, we need to listen. So as we go down to the part in Hebrews eleven seven, 7, after the holy fear, it says this. Because of the holy fear, he built an ark to save his family. It's coming. So his faith was expressed in obedience. Let's go back to Genesis now. I hope you're enjoying it, like back and forth. We got that technology, we can do that this now. Genesis 6, 22. Now it says that Noah, it doesn't say he procrastinated. It didn't say he questioned. It says Noah did everything just as God commanded. I, I want to ask all of you, what was God asked you to build? What has he asked you to build? And I just want to remind you, there's no overnight successes. Whenever we see someone's done something great, it, man, it, it's time, it's hard work. Um, as I was uh, growing up in the faith and going to church um, and starting to learn some of these stories, I was taught that it took Noah 120 years to build this ark. 120 years. I'm like, 120 years? What, wait, what the, what's going on? How, what? But um, there is a group that's actually down in, um, down towards San Diego. It's called Answers in Genesis. And by the way, if some of you guys want to dip, dive deeper into the whole Noah story or anything in Genesis, go ahead and write this down. Answers in Genesis is the name of the group. And you can go onto their website. They have tons of resources and stuff. But there's all these brilliant minds and theologians have got together and really are just with, with technology and everything else, like looking at the scriptures and is what the, the Bible saying in Genesis, is it true? Is it true? And so um, they, they dived into this Genesis account of Noah and a flood. And they start calculating all of this stuff. And they said there could be a tentative range instead of 120. And again, you have to go on their website and see Mary. If you go on there, they, they'll, they'll map it out very clearly. That they believe that it would have taken him 55 to 75 years um, for him to build the ark. Now, I was always the impression, like, he started and built it all himself, and then his boys got old enough, and they helped out, and then just the family built it. But I don't know, a lot of people are asking the question, like, gosh, I, could he have, like, employed other people? And they're like, well, why would they build something they don't believe in? Why would they do something like that? Well, for the paycheck. Some of you have worked for employers, you don't believe in them either. But you need that paycheck. You ever worked for a really bad boss? Well, I'm looking around at all my people, right? Tell me that in the office, not in here, right? Connie. <laughs> but looking at this, possibly, he could have incorporated having these people work on it. And, and uh, I want to say in this, uh, uh, this company, Answers in Genesis, they actually had one of the guys that helped um, build that ark that's out in Kentucky. And uh, they're building this huge ark, and he actually, there was a guy that was there, a construction worker was there, and on the back of his car, he had, um, you know how some Christians have that uh, Jesus fish on the back, the little ichthus? You ever seen that? It's on the back of the car. Um, this guy had one that wasn't the ichthus, and it's opposite of what we believe, and it's an atheist making fun of the Christian God. And there. And so the guy was pointing out that, huh, even an atheist who doesn't believe in any of this will come and work and build something that supposedly didn't exist. So just so you know. So maybe they got them all involved, but if you think about the years it took to build this thing, how about you? Has God put something in your heart? I know some, God's put something in my heart for this church and for us as a body of believers here in Riverside. And me and Martha just talked about, it. I mean, I wish it would happen overnight, but it's going to take years to build something great. It takes time. So what has God asked you to build? And has it taken one, two, three, ten, thirty, or thirty-five years or more? Will we be faithful to do what God has called us to do, to build what he has asked us to build? So as we think about this and this understanding of Noah and what he was trying to build, can you imagine as he started building this thing, do you notice that whenever you want to try to build something big and great that God's put on your heart, there's always the naysayers. Younger generation, we call them haters. Right? Haters. These people are always going, what are you doing? Are you crazy? Are you silly? That's ridiculous. How much did Noah and his team that were building this thing hear that? 
How long did that happen? So again, if he was building it for 55 to 75 years, I'm assuming it would have been that long. So let's look back at Hebrews 11.7 as we go to a next step inside of um, this passage. It says in here, talk about Noah's faith. It says in verse 7, I've highlighted it for you. It says, by his faith, he condemned the world. Condemned. This word is a word that, that's used to, pron to pronounce sentence on. So the people over the years are watching him building this thing, and they're organizing it. And by the way, I'm sure he was trying to figure out, like, how do we build such a monstrosity of a, of a, of a structure? But as he's building it, and they're, they're making fun of him, maybe even the crew workers are building it going, thanks for paying us, but we're building this thing, and I just don't see it. I just don't see it. Oh, man, the Lord just put something on my heart about that. You know how many times people have doubted me? And doubted you. And all you know is they're like, that sounds very ridiculous and silly. And you're like, well, Rich, what do we do? Well, God told me. I don't know. i got to build it. Noah had those people as well. I wanted to go somewhere very uh, particular with this uh, message. And then as I was preparing it, God kind of did this little, little turn, which he does with me from time to time. I want to show you a scripture in 1 Peter 3.20. This just alludes to, to Noah. This isn't about exactly Noah, but it's talking about something else. You can go back and read it in its full context. But Peter points out something very particular that happened during the time of Noah. It says this, 1 Peter 3.20. It says... <clears throat> To those who were disobedient long ago. It's highlighting what happened in the past. It said this. God patiently waited. He waited patiently on them. So no one was building, right? So while... The ark was being built. God was being patient with them. And in it, only a few people, eight in all, that talks about knowing his family, were saved through the water. As I was thinking through this, I'm going, gosh, there are all those people. I mean, and again, this is why some people have a hang-up in regards to Christianity and following God. It's like, well, I don't want to follow God who would just kill all of his creation. Do you remember when we read the verse that talked about how the, the world was corrupted and there was violence everywhere? And it said, who did it? Them. Not, not God. And by the way, what we see in this world, it's not God. It's people doing what people sometimes do when they don't know God the way we know him. So I want to show you there in 1 Peter, he's, he's alluding to this, that God was waiting patiently and by the way, that's why God still tarries today. You know why we're not all in heaven like right now? He's being patient with us. He's being patient with our family member who still makes fun of us for showing up to church on Sunday and then giving money. He's being patient because he wants all people to come to know him. So as we look back at the Hebrews 11, 7, he's, he's again, I, I hope you're enjoying this. I mean, it's so rich. The Bible's so rich. I know some of you have read this, this chapter, right? And you just went over. I mean, there's so much just in this 11.7 to dive into. So back to Hebrews 11.7, there's another part that I want to highlight here. So the last one we just read said, by his faith, he condemned the world. But watch this. By his faith, he became an heir of the righteousness that is in keeping with faith. He did what God told him to do, and him and his family were saved. Saved. But why? What, what, what was the distinguishing factor between, between um, uh, Noah and everyone else of his time? He was a righteous man, faithful to God, following him, just like his, his uh, great-grandfather Enoch. He walked with God, had a relationship with God. I 
want to point something out that is so beautiful, and you've never learned this. Hold on to this until God calls you home or takes you home, calls all of us home. You know, all through the Old Testament, there's beautiful pictures all throughout the Old Testament that will paint a picture of what Jesus has done for you and for me. It's all over it. It was, it was set up, and that's why all through the New Testament, they're alluding to the Old Testament over and over and over again. It's like, it's kind of like this, and Jesus is a picture of that. It's kind of like this. Jesus is fulfilling that. Did you know that the ark in itself is a beautiful picture of Jesus himself? A vessel on where humanity can be saved. So as we look at this, it wasn't just a physical survival, of course, as we just read in the verse that this righteousness that came to, to him by keeping the faith, it wasn't just a physical thing, it was also a spiritual thing for him and his family. And eternal, and eternal life comes in a very special way too, which we'll talk about. So as you look back and we, we, we think about this, you know, we look back at the, the Genesis 7, 1 scriptures and it talks about that, that God at one point says to come into the ark. And Noah's family went into this, this ark and this is something so interesting. When he was designing this ark, remember we went through all the list of things that he needed to do. It was this size and this size and make some windows for it and it's going to have this and that. But he said put a door, singular, one door in the side. One door. One door. The ark had one door. And I want to show you something very interesting. Some of you uh, know these scriptures. I want to show you John 10, 9. And I'm going to show you in the ESV version. But it points out very clearly. John 10, 9 says, Jesus is speaking here, by the way. Jesus says, I am the door, or maybe some of you guys memorize this verse, the gate. I'm the opening. I'm the door. Can you see it? The ark that's being built that saves humanity. It has what? One what? Door. One door. And Jesus says, I am the door. This is where everything started to change as I'm looking at the scripture. And Isaac, as I'm diving into this and going, okay, Lord, what do you want me to teach our church? What are the people who might be tuning in or are here today that don't know the Lord the way we know him? What do they got to know? There's an ark for all of humanity right now. And I know some of you have been criticized for your faith and made fun of. And by the way, when I first started following the Lord, especially when I got into, like, ministry, my mom on the phone one time said, what kind of cult are you in? And her alcoholism took her straight to couldn't understand, and she couldn't understand why I had the marriage that I had, and I was having the family, having, how my life was changing. It was because there was a door. And when I got called to go to that door, I opened my heart to the door, and I went through the door. In John 14, 6, it says this way, Jesus is answering them, he's talking to them. John 14, 6 says, Jesus answered, I am the way. This is, this is the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And it says what? No one comes to the Father except what? You got to enter. You got to enter. And what we understand in the Genesis passage, go back and, and look at it. And when God finally says, okay, enough's enough, and bring all the animals in and bring your family in and come through the door, at one point, God himself shuts the door. He shuts it. Look, Genesis 7, 16. Let me show it to you. This is frightful for the people of this time. <clears throat> Genesis 7, 16. So as the animals are going in, we're male and female and of every living creature as God had commanded Noah. And then look, it says, then the Lord shut him in. Door was shut. 
Now just imagine with me for a second. I don't know if you've ever thought about this. You know, his family are just honoring God and <clears throat> they're just doing what God's asking them to do. It's finally built, and then now all the animals are coming. It's like, oh, man, the animals are showing up. Okay, we're doing this thing. They're getting in, and then they get in. God says, that's enough. He shuts the door. And then the water comes. Judgment comes to this planet. Did any of you ever see those horrific videos that came out of Thailand years ago? When a tsunami hit the beach side of, of, of Thailand? And beach goers thought it would be really hilarious to watch the waters go out and see the waters come in. And guess what happened for some of them? I mean, there's people up videotaping this when they had videotape. Water started rushing in. And I'll never forget this one lady just hanging on to a thing as the water's rushing in and it swept her and she went under and she disappeared. I don't even know how many people died on that day. Can you imagine Noah's time there? They made fun of him for years watching this being built, or maybe even some of them worked on it. He's crazy. Then the door is shut. It's too late. And the water's rising. I don't know. Did anyone ever come to the ark and start, let us in? I, I, don't, I don't know. I'm assuming so. This is a horrific scene. And by the way, we were reminded as a uh, Tina. And John and I were sitting down and going through some of this stuff. Uh, John pointed out something that, that we did um, when we built our nursery for our first child. We thought we would just design the whole nursery around Noah's Ark. Whole nursery. It was, it was the cutest thing. We spent a lot of money. I remember after getting it up, remember I looked at you, Tim, I said, so we're... we're, we're we're raising our child up in this nursery that's so cute. All these cute little animals in it. That's a picture of death and destruction. You ever thought about that, huh? It's not so cute. It's horrible. There's something worse coming. For those that don't know the Lord, and if you don't know the Lord, can I? It never says that, that Noah preached to them. Maybe he did. By just doing what he was doing, I think he, he preached loud and clear. I want to show you Matthew 24, 37 through 42. Now you get heavy thinking about this because many of you, please, church, look at me, please. All of you, look at me, please. If you know, you know the Lord Jesus, Take this to heart. This is going to happen. Matthew 24, 37 through 42. Mentions Noah again. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. And if you don't know what that means, it means this. The Bible teaches us that, that when Jesus, after he died on the cross and he ascended to heaven and we're still on this planet and we can open our hearts to him and receive the grace he's given to us through the cross and shed of blood uh, for all of our sins, covering that we can be made right with God. That he's coming back someday. No, no, please, understand this. Take this to heart, church on the hill. Before you leave today, God could draw a line in the sand of the hands of time and come back. It says in verse 38 of Matthew 24, For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. I'm looking at our ones that are about to get married here within the next, how many days did you say, Adam? 26 days. 27 days? You better get it right. She's right by you. <laughs> They're getting married here at Church on the Hill. But people are making plans. They're eating. They're drinking. They're, they're giving away in marriage. They're, they're planning all these plans. Back in Noah's day, nothing's changed. It says, up to the day of Noah entered the ark. Look at verse 39. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. They couldn't understand what is going on here. And by the way, isn't this true for us today? 
people don't understand when we tell them. We, we're trying to share with, I hope you're trying to share with them. And if you're like, Pastor, well, you're really fired up. Yes, I am. I have family members in heaven right now, and I have family members that are in hell right now. And why couldn't she see? But I was in a cult, is what my mom said. So as we look back into this verse, verse tw- uh, 39, and they knew nothing about what would happen, and the flood came and took them all away. Now watch what he says here. Jesus very clear says, that is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. When I come back, this is going to happen again. It says two men will be in the field working away. Then I don't know where one, gone. It's gone. Christians, remember us talking about this last Sunday? Crazy, right? In verse 41 it says, didn't leave you ladies out. Don't want to be sexist. It says two women will be grinding at the hand, hand mill. And it says this, one will be taken and the other left. And he puts a therefore there. So everything I just said, so, so fat is to come. It says, therefore, keep watch. Keep watch. Because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. I, I, I love our church team. I, I, I love teams. I don't love figuring, I, I really can't figure everything out on my own. I, I need a team around me in every aspect. And for those of you who just served in leadership with me, you know I need, I need you. And those that are still not on the board, I'm looking at one perfect person. I still need you to speak into my life and help us with this church. Because we're putting this together, Tina goes, well, just don't forget, like, this weekend, we're remembering 9-11. And I don't know what I said. John, what did I say? I said, I'm such a moron. I don't know how, it, how old you were when 9-11 hit, but... I was working for the city of San Bernardino. You can remember where you're at for some of you who are old enough to remember what happened. I was heading to work to downtown San Bernardino to work for the city. And as I'm driving down, I'm listening to AM radio. And the guy's talking about whatever he's talking about. And next thing you know, he says, oh, man, it looks like an airplane has run into one of the World Trade Center towers. And in my mind, I'm thinking a little Cessna, right? A little meh. Like Caleb drives, right? Right? And then as I start to get off the freeway to go onto D Street, to go to downtown San Bernardino, to go to by our offices work by City Hall, as I'm getting ready to turn, he says, Oh my God, a second plane has hit the other tower. I don't think this is an accident. And I'm thinking, what, what, wait, what, what's going on? Do you remember? Do you remember where you were? Or do you remember getting that phone call from your sister? That's what happened to Tammy. As I pull into the the structure there for for the city, and I pull in, um, our offices used to be right next door, or right across the hallway from Congressman Joe Baca's office. And as I'm going to the back door where us employees would go in, I'm going to the door, and one of his assistants is walking up to the door, and she's on her cell phone, and she is shaking, and she's trying to get the key into the hole. And I'm going, okay, this is the congressman's assistant. She's got to know more than, than what I just heard. And I'm like, oh, here, I got it, and I, I got the door open. And she's bawling, and she's crying, and she's all, and she's running as fast as she can to her office. And so I'm the first one to get to the office in my office, and I unarm it and get inside. And, and I can't remember if I called you right away, if I went on the internet, I can't remember. No one knew at that time what was happening. How many people got up to go to the World Trade Center to work that day, just thought, this is just another day. Just another day. 
And it wasn't. It wasn't. Husbands were taken that day. Wives were taken that day. Children were taken that way, that day. It was a horrific day in American history. And the scripture says that no man knows the hour. No one knows. But church, can we be alert to it? Can we stop being petty about all the other things that are of this world? There's a world going to hell. And we know the door. And we can't shove them through the door. As I told Martha this week, you know, we, we, you know that old adage, you could take a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. And when I was younger as a youth pastor, I'd go, then I'd just force them to drink. That means drown them. But at least say, there's a door. So as we look at the, the passage of, in Noah, and it's talking about, by faith, Noah built. What is God asking you to build? But don't miss this beautiful picture of this ark is a picture of Jesus. Next week, if each and every one of us don't invite at least one person through these doors, start there. Or at least invite them to like click online. It's very harmless. They're online. I'm not going to like steal your money or shame you for anything. But maybe, just maybe, by an invitation, they'll come. But I'm going to ask you today as I have our worship team come up and as we close. If, you, if you're here today or watching online today and you, you haven't put your faith in Jesus. Here's an invitation to walk through that door right, right now. Jordan, remember when you did that? I remember you did that. I remember that Sunday you gave your life to Christ. So thankful. This is an invitation for you. The door is wide open for anyone who will just say, Lord, I need you. You don't have to have it all figured out. Actually, it's so simple. We made it so simple here at Church on the Hill. We took this from another church, I did at least, from years ago. We called it the ABCs of salvation. Remember this, Andy? Andy can get up here and give it like this. Why? Because guys like him and I, it's simple. A is this. Admit that you're a sinner. Admit it. Just admit it. You, you sin against God in heaven. You, you know you're a sinner. People back in Noah's day knew they were sinners. So admit it. Say, okay, God, I admit I'm a sinner. And by the way, you can just say this in your own mind to God. He hears you. Just right now, say, I, I admit I'm a sinner. The B and ABCs is this. I believe to choose. I believe to follow and choose to follow God. I choose to follow him, but i got to believe first of what he did on the cross, that he came in his body, he was on the cross, and he died for all humanity's sin. The ark is given over. And you say, I don't have it all figured out, but, but I believe that you died on the cross for me. You were trying to make things right with you and me. And so, God, I believe now that you did that on the cross for me, and that you died, and you were buried, and that you were raised on the third day. Then the C is super simple. A, B, C, simple. Just choose to follow him. Choose to follow him. Remember, that's what Noah did. He just, okay, God said, here we go. In everything that you need to figure out in this walk, You'll figure it out. God will lead you and guide you. And we'll help lead and guide you into what it means to be a fully, fle like a full-fledged believer in Jesus. There's only one way, though. So you can pray to that to God. I admit I'm a sinner. I believe what you did on the cross and you died for me. And I'm now choosing to follow you. That's it. The Bible says then you're a child of God. But I'll just leave this on the note. And for you dear Christians, and again, if you made a decision to follow Christ, let us know. But for the rest of us that do know God, don't keep this a secret. How dare us? Because there's going to be a point where God says, enough's enough. Door's shut. 
won't, won't God give them a second chance? In my understanding of Scripture, but, but can God change his mind? All I know is I have the Scripture. Tony Wright, that's all we've got. Well, if I was God, but you're not, and I'm not. Let's tell this world there's a door, and they can walk through it as we've walked through it. Because there will be a day where there's enough's enough, and God will. Thanks, Pastor. Really encouraging message, Pastor. It should be, because if you've ever had a loved one who you prayed for for years, or a person you know who you're like, no way that ever come to the saving grace of knowing Jesus, and then they did. There's nothing better. There's nothing better. Church, let me close in prayer before as we worship God. God, I thank you for those that may have accepted you as Savior. And it says in the Bible that heaven is throwing a party for them. God, for those of us that have known you for years, and and again, it is so easy to just get worn down by this life and not remember why we're still here. That God, we would lead people to the door, the one that can save their lives, which is you, Jesus. You said you are the door. You are the gate. You're the only way. So God, help us. Please, God, help us. We beg that God, you'll give us conversations with our neighbors, with our children in this world, Lord, that don't know you yet, God, that they can come to the saving grace of knowing you, that there's an an ark, which is you, Jesus, that could save them not just physically now, but eternally forever. So, God, thank you for this message. Thank you for Noah and the, the, the book of Hebrews, God, and the by faith chapter that we're studying. This is so rich, and we thank you for it. So with all that, God, now we're going to, as Church on the Hill, here in our worship center, we're going to worship you the way you should be worshipped in a way that we're saying back to you, thank you for calling me to go through your door. Thank you for calling me to be your child. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Church, would you stand and worship this wonderful God if you're able?